Lords, you have heard many tales that many tellers have told you. How Paris took Helen, the evil and the pain he felt. Of Tristan that Le Chevre spoke rather beautifully about. And Fablio and Epics, of the romance of Yvain and his beast. And many others told in this land. But never have you heard about the war that was difficult and lengthy between Reynard and Isengrim. Hello and welcome. My name's Philip, and what you've just heard was a modern translation of the opening lines of the Roman de Reynard, written by Pierre de Saint Cloud in 1174. The Roman de Reynard is just one of many collections of stories about one of medieval Europe's most popular folk heroes, Reynard the Fox. Reynard the Fox is the classic trickster hero, using his cunning and wiles to outsmart and embarrass his opponents. His usual enemy is the greedy wolf Isengrim, and the two are often joined by a recurring cast of animal characters, such as King Noble the Lion, Chanticleer, the rooster with the golden voice, Tibbert, the prince of cats, Grimbard the badger, and a whole host of others. The tales usually concern Reynard tricking the other animals to his advantage or to escape some punishment, or just foiling the schemes of the greedy Isengrim. And these stories were popular, massively so. They likely originated in the Lorraine region of northeastern France, but quickly spread throughout the rest of the country and Western Europe. They were so popular that they actually changed the French language. You might have noticed that in modern French, the word for a fox is Reynard. Well, in old French, the word was actually Goupil, but these stories were so popular that people started to use the name Reynard to refer to the animal. This is sort of like if you remember when the film Finding Nemo came out and kids all started calling clownfish Nemos. Now imagine that happened except it became so common that the word clownfish fell out of usage entirely and they were just called Nemos from now on. That's what happened and it is crazy. But the character of Reynard and his adventures didn't just spring up overnight. They're part of a tradition that goes back a lot earlier. It may come as no surprise that the stories about talking animals have their roots in the fables of antiquity. In the first century, a Roman fabulist named Gaius Julius Phaedrus translated the fables of Aesop from Greek into Latin. Centuries later, monks who were tasked with copying Latin texts would amuse themselves by copying out the fables and putting their own twists on them. You see, in the medieval period, fables starring anthropomorphic animals were a great tool for satirists. Monks, and then later poets, could put their arguments in the mouths of these imaginary beasts, or mock their superiors by having them crudely parodied by creatures. In the 8th century, Benedictine monk and historian Paul the Deacon transcribed his own version of one of Phaedrus's fables, the sick lion. In this tale, the lion is ill and asks for all the animals to come and offer him a cure. All the animals do so, except for the fox. The bear points this out to the lion and convinces him that it is proof of the fox's treachery, and so he should be killed. The lion agrees, but when the fox hears of this, he presents himself to the lion claiming he didn't arrive straight away because he was traveling in order to discover a cure for the lion's ailment. He then says that he has found a cure and that it is to wrap himself in a coat made of bearskin. 
the bear is skinned, the lion is cured, and the fox is lauded as a hero. This particular fable appears again in an anonymous text from the 11th century known as Ecbasis Captivi. Written in Latin, Ecbasis Captivi, or The Captive's Escape, is a story within a story that includes a retelling of the sick lion, but with some important changes. First, the bear is now a wolf, and in fact the wolf is the villain of the framing story as well. Secondly, the lion is now explicitly a king, and the other animals hold positions in the royal court. Third, the wolf is motivated by jealousy of the fox, and once he is flayed, the fox is given a position as regent. Finally, the narrative is explicitly more Christian. The fox gives us an excuse, not that he was just looking for a cure, but that he was on pilgrimage, praying for the lion. In fact, he humorously gives us evidence, a sack full of old shoes that he has worn out from walking so far. The importance of the captive's escape is that it shows a cultural melding of the classical fable style and the medieval worldview. The animals are more anthropomorphic. The world they live in reflects the medieval courts. And the message is specifically more Christian allegory. We also begin to see the cast of characters start to solidify. The crafty fox, the greedy wolf, the lion who is the king. This ensemble would appear again in the 12th century, but this time they would finally be given names. Written in either 1148 or 1149, Isengrimus is a Latin mock epic poem recounting the various encounters between the wolf Isengrim and his rival, the cunning fox Reynard. At the start of the poem, Isengrim successfully deceives Reynard, but this is his only victory. The rest of the story is Isengrim being tricked and embarrassed in various different ways. Now the poem is in the Fablio style, which is a rather um, bawdy comic style which uses sometimes a lot of crass language. For example, in one story, Reynard tricks Isengrim into going ice fishing by using his tail as a net. When his tail then gets frozen to the lake, Reynard tells him to jump up and move quickly, to which Isengrim replies, Nescis quid perfide dicas, clunibus impendent scotia tota meis. Or in English, you don't know what you're saying, deceiver. I have all of Scotland hanging from my bum. Future Reynard stories would also often follow the Fablio style, as it was perfect for satire. See, these stories were often performed with masks and music, and the stock characters were really great for travelling mummers to use to improvise with. The butts of the joke were usually the aristocracy and the clergy. Isengrim, in particular, would often be mocked for his uh, lasciviousness, his greed, and his false piety. In one tale, Reynard is thought dead, and all of his enemies come to his funeral and perform hilariously over-the-top elegies, for which Reynard eventually punishes them for their insincerity. In this regard, Reynard can be seen as a peasant hero, punishing the upper classes for their hypocrisy. That's not always the case though. You see, as the Renard stories were passed around, edited, amended, added to, built upon, and changed, Renard became anything that the authors needed him to be. In some tales, his tricks become more overtly mean-spirited and cruel. In others, he is the villain. 
For example, when Chanticleer the rooster is the hero, it makes sense for a fox to be his enemy. In some stories, the animals are basically humans. They have courts and kings, laws, punishments and priests. In others, they are wild beasts. The Reynard mythos became something organic and malleable, a pool which authors and poets could dip into for centuries to come. And to be honest, that is probably the coolest thing about the Reynard stories. He's a folk hero, much like Robin Hood. Every generation puts their own spin on it. A story we all know so well, yet keep coming back to again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Speaking of which, Walt Disney actually wanted to make a feature film based on the stories of Reynard and Chanticleer. Unfortunately, the production was eventually scrapped in favour of a different medieval setting, with 1963's The Sword in the Stone. After Walt Disney passed away, the company returned to the idea, scrapping the story but reusing the character designs in 1973's Robin Hood. This is why Robin Hood is a fox, the sheriff is a wolf, the king a lion, and Alan a dale a rooster. These animal allegories, which we just sort of accepted, actually have roots that go back 900 years. It's amazing to think that a child from the Norman period could watch an animated film made in the 1970s about talking animals and think, yeah, that makes sense. The legend of Reynard lives on to this day, even if we haven't noticed it. Thanks for watching, farewell. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed our video on Reynard the Fox. If you really liked it, do click the like button and subscribe, and uh, comment below, let us know what you think. Maybe if you've got some other ideas of videos that you'd like to see us do, just pop those down as well. We do read every comment that we get, really enjoy hearing from you. Well, I'll see you guys in the next video. Have fun, until then, farewell. It's you. You're famous.